You guys just come on up, poor Benji. I feel like you're getting two hours of commercial crew, but <laughs> sorry about that. Um, John Mulholland, uh, let me get your titles right. I always kind of mess this up, and we should have, uh, I should have it nailed by now, but Vice President, Program Manager, Commercial Program, <laughs> Space Exploration for Boeing, and Benji, I know you're just introduced, but you're Director of Commercial Crew Mission Management, SpaceX. Thank you both for coming again. So I really appreciated uh, uh, Steve to watch this. I did not wear uh, appropriate. I found out women's clothing doesn't lend itself to <laughs> microphones very well. But um, uh, I actually had a set of charts that we can maybe start with mine. Um, I appreciated Steve uh, kind of talking about the tipping point because uh, I was going to kind of do this overview that talked about how we've, we've used the tipping point. So I appreciated Steve Lindsay's comments because really I think it's, it, you know, we're here, we're talking about how to enable commercialization, how can we kind of, and we've been working really in commercial crew to change the face of human space transportation. So let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, once again, just want to remind everybody, you know, NASA had a vision. We had a vision for a commercial human space flight to low Earth orbit, that there would be a robust, vibrant in enterprise with many providers and with the goal of having a wide range of government and public use. And you can see how that original vision for cargo has really evolved during Ben's uh, panel. Uh, the commercial crew program really the, it had an uh, objective of providing not only a NASA purpose but also a public purpose. So we were really trying to be a tipping point, trying to enable through safe transport of NASA and NASA sponsored astronauts to and from the space station to also enable the development of non-NASA markets for commercial human transportation services to and from low Earth orbit. And so we wanted to provide, through some of the things that Steve brought up, to provide um, a, a portion of the business case to be able to then enable industry to use that as a tipping point to enable other uh, non-NASA, potential non-NASA pursuits. You know, and some of this, this is, Steve pointed out, this was not a new idea. I mean, this is really an idea that's been around for a while. And, and there's this concept of learning by doing. And, and history's taught us that you can start with, a, with um, establishing a need and then laying the groundwork. And, and through this need and, and working through the need, then you can start learning how to better conduct the commercial missions and enable the commercial capabilities. You know, uh, Bob was talking at the beginning of CRS, we really, when we laid out what we were hoping to get, it was really through the doing that it really enabled the providers to further expand their capabilities and provide the, the services. We weren't even sure we were going to get 20 metric tons at the beginning. I think we, in some cases, rounded up. And, and look at the capability that, that industry came to the table with once we just enabled a need for that. So there's a foundation, you know, under, with the airline example, there was a government transition infrastructure to, in, to industry. You know, they looked at how, what other capabilities are out there that could enable the work through postal service. Um, they also started establishing aviation regulations and, and setting up the infrastructure to be able to enable industry to be able to understand the risk concepts under which and the structure under which they're having to operate. Um, obviously, public safety had to be balanced with industry needs, and so air traffic rules were enforced, you know, airways, you know, where people were landing was enforced, um, how pilots were licensed and, and aircraft certified, and obviously, most importantly, air traffic control established. So how does this apply to human space flight? So using the initial concepts of that model, we then went and said, first with cargo, how could we do that? And then following on that same concept with crew. 
So really this idea of, of, com of commercializing human space flight in the same way has been around for a while, right? I mean, when we looked at the efforts to privatize space shuttle and commercialize International Space Station, this has been a concept that, that has been looked at in the 90s. Um, we had to go look at what enables that to really work. And then as the Commercial Space Act was passed by Congress, then through the early 2000 timeframe, that's when NASA started to develop their draft commercialization development plan and policies. And that really is what kind of gradually then laid the groundwork for the, the COTS program and then enabled then the Commercial Resupply Services program. So Commercial Crew has multiple goals. Our number one goal was, as Steve was mentioning, you have to establish a need. And I do think it's really important to talk about how well does that need then align with industry's needs and their, their business case and what they want to be working for and how well does that fit into their overall business concepts. Um, I was really happy to see your presentation, Steve, because I was like, wow, I could be part two to Steve's presentation here. So the, the most important thing, we had to define what do we, what do we want? Obviously, we wanted crew transportation services, and we wanted further capabilities to be able to fly the powered, um, the, the key powered scientific cargo that needs to go to and from station. Um, we wanted to help industry meet NASA's requirements, and we really wanted to work to how can we get this cadence of the flight activities going from a government standpoint and moving in to be able to have that be provided from a commercial standpoint. And most importantly, it, going back to our public purpose, we did want to act as a catalyst to be able to enable commercial human space flight to low Earth orbit. So we began by laying the groundwork. You know, we had to kind of establish, how do you establish an approach that, that enables a transfer of the lessons learned, you know, and but at the same time balancing what our needs are and what industry's needs were. So we spent a lot of time trying to make sure that our requirement sets weren't potentially preventing our providers from, from providing a future commercial capability. If we're requiring such a specialized capability, then that really isn't what's gonna enable low Earth orbit capability. So we, we had to establish and then define what kind of partnerships would enable that. Um, we had to look at how do, we, how do we work with industry to be able to get input on our requirements, input on different ways of doing the contract to be able to enable their, um, their being able to introduce this capability and be able to potentially sell it in other markets. Um, if we had established a contract in a particular way, we could have limited their capabilities and, and their ability to be able to use it in a commercial way. So we, used, we were very careful about how we use our contracts and Space Act agreements. Um, we worked to certify integrated space systems. Um, you know, we asked for a crew transportation capability. We didn't ask for a, a spacecraft and a launch vehicle. We wanted an integrated commercial capability. Um, and then we also provided that the cornerstone um, need by validating that we had the intent to buy services. What's really important is we really had to come into it by saying how do we help, how do we help industry get there, right? And looked at how do we make infrastructure assets available? How do we um, allow companies to retain their intellectual property rights? How do we foster unique partnerships and collaborations to enable the capability that they're providing for us to also be able to be provided for other folks. Finally, you know, we had to facilitate supporting a legal framework. You know, it, it take, took a lot to work through one of, this is one of the most painful things I learned by doing on the cargo resupply side was really figuring out the interagency, intergovernmental, and international partner agreements to be able to work the contract through the licensing phases and, and that same learning then went, it was even more complicated to be able to establish that same framework on the crew side. So we had to go put in um, legislation for government astronaut capability. We've had to work with the FAA now for over five years on ensuring that we can move from the NASA mission phase 
that we'll be working on under the demo missions into our, our post-certification missions, our crew rotation missions, and make sure that that transition with the regulatory agencies is seamless. Um, we've had to work through how to make sure we have our, the comm coverage we need, the spectrum usage that we need for crew capabilities. But what this has taken is that we need to make sure that government and industry are working together to also that the things that we're establishing now can be learned from to help future commercial um, space flight capabilities be and move toward um, the regulatory framework that would be needed for those. You know, we've had a lot of help within the government to be able to make this happen. There's been a ton of interagency collaboration. I already talked a little bit about the legislation and the regulation. Um, ton of uh, interagency discussions with DOD. All this is is learning that we need to make sure we capture and then and um, translate to what needs to be done to be able to support human space flight in low Earth orbit and have it be a seamless and understood process to be able to do that. So, um, you know, we're getting ready to fly. I, I'm really happy to hear everybody say, hey, they're looking forward to us flying next year. That there's not anyone in this room, and I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll argue about what that you two were gonna tell me you care about it more, but I really wanna see us fly this year. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, so uh, we, you know, we're, we have preparations for, it's amazing to me, and it's, it was just so much fun to hear how many missions Ven's been able to go do and all the cadence there, but it's really going to be amazing for us to have the same cadence because as we see today, flying crew to station is a serious business, and we have to be able to fly regularly. So. These folks, they're getting ready. Our launch pads are ready. Their mission control centers are already, we're doing joint simulations with both these programs. We're, we're, we're working to be ready as a joint team. Um, our Air Force range and FAA agreements are in place. Um, and you're gonna hear a lot more from these two folks on the panel about what they're doing to get their systems ready. It's a big year. So we're near the end. I appreciate it. I keep quoting Steve, but every day does get harder. <laughs> it gets even harder at the end, as these folks can tell you. Um, so these last few ones are big ones, and uh, but we're making it. You have to sometimes look back to see all the pain and suffering. So you need to do that too. Look, have your milestone charts. So now I'm going to turn it over to. I guess, John, you're next, because I saw your chart showing up first. We'll, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> yes. Here you go. Hey, good. Thanks. Hey, three quick things before um, we roll into the charts. Pat, thank you again for another outstanding conference. Kathy, for your leadership, right? It's been a long road, a lot of green check marks, and uh, testament to your leadership. And third, you know, we had a uh, safe landing of crew today on Soyuz. Um, arguably much shorter mission than they had envisioned a few hours earlier, but you know, it's a real uh, good reminder of the unforgiving nature of all of our business and, uh, and the need to make sure we get everything right. Uh, nominal systems, abort systems, everything. So we'll just kind of walk through and see what we're doing to make sure it's right.
So tremendous amount of progress. Uh, you know, usually I talk about the con ops on this, but um, you know, it's just it's a great chart because it just kind of highlights the complexity and the broadness of the program. You know, the launch vehicle uh, and the progress we've made on that, the spacecraft, flight day one rendezvous anomaly, but just making sure all systems and all teams are ready, not only for the launch day operations, the landing and recovery, uh, the mission ops team, and, and the build team, right? The build team that's got to do the initial build that we're going through now, but just make sure we have the readiness for, um, for the assembly and refurbishment between missions. All right, so looking at the spacecraft and the launch vehicle. So you, you look at uh, the spacecraft, obviously a, an expendable service module, 52 total thrusters on the service module, uh, four of them the launch aboard engines, composite base heat shield with a, um, a lightweight ablator on the bottom, reusable crew module, land on land, combination of parachutes and airbags, uh, composite forward heat shield, ascent cover. Um, so the crew module will be reusable. Um, the other articles on there, including the ascent cover, forward heat shield, base heat shield, uh, will be expendable every flight. And moving over to the launch vehicle, you know, really near ready. In fact, I'll show you on a chart in a couple pages that uh, they're actually shipping out the, uh, the booster for the uncrewed flight here in the next several days. Um, but everything else on the system is, uh, is, is complete and ready, including the structural uh, adapter, the emergency detection system, uh, and the dual engine Centaur configuration. So a lot of progress uh, on both the launch vehicle and the spacecraft. You know, looking at the spacecraft, you know, three, three spacecrafts that are currently in some semblance of build. The one not on the chart is a structural test article that's nearing its, uh, its final test series, but uh, the paddleboard test vehicle we call Spacecraft One. Uh, it's at the factory, it's ready. As many of you know, we had uh, a minor valve anomaly during one of our uh, big test programs I'll talk about in the chart. Uh, so we're waiting for those valves to get rebuilt. We'll put them in the service module. Uh, and we'll send that vehicle out to a, out here to White Sands Missile Range. We'll do a paddleboard test in the spring. Uh, the uncrewed flight test, the, the pictures in the middle, uh, we call Spacecraft 3. It'll obviously be the first craft that, uh, that flies. Uh, tremendous amount of progress on the lower dome. It's got the avionics and the life support system. We've already been through a successful power-up test. 86% of the outfitting is complete. Um, and so as soon as we ship out Spacecraft 2 for testing, uh, we'll do the join and the final preparations for Spacecraft 3. Uh, tremendous amount of progress. And then over on the right-hand side is Spacecraft 2. So that'll be the crewed flight test. Before it goes on the crewed flight test, it's going to go out to El Segundo uh, for its environmental test series. Uh, the service module on the bottom is already out there. The crew module on the top is within thankfully a single digit number of days before it ships out to El Segundo and we'll get into that test campaign that we need to have done before we do the uncrewed flight test. So launch vehicle, as I mentioned, a lot of progress uh, out at Decatur getting these launch vehicles ready. Uh, you see the dual engine Centaurs on the left, the core stages or the boosters uh, in the middle and as I mentioned the uh, Uncrewed flight test booster is, is getting ready to ship out to Florida, uh, and then the structural adapters on the right. So just tremendous amount of progress and a lot of readiness uh, from ULA, not only on the hardware, uh, but on the, on the launch pad. So we're only waiting for uh, one ground cart, and, uh, and we'll have initial operational capability for the entire launch pad. So tremendous amount of progress. You know, the real focus besides spacecraft build for us right now is is the completion of the integrated test uh, that we have really across the country. So I mentioned structural test article. Uh, we're within several weeks of, of getting into the final phase of the structural test article, we'll, which will be a fixed tunnel test. So we'll test the, uh, the atmospheric loads on the spacecraft uh, and also the, the loads on landing. And so that'll be the final series of structural test article. Uh, service module hot fire test being done out here at NASA White Sands test facility. As I mentioned, we had an anomaly on the valves, on the abort valves uh, during the first test series. Uh, we're in there now replacing components. Uh, and we'll get into service module hot fire test um, before we do the crude flight test. So the team's turning that around and making sure those abort thrusters operate correctly um, if they're ever needed. Over on the top right, environmental testing. You can see the readiness there of the uh, 
of the ground equipment that will be used for the, uh, for the Thermovac test. But as I mentioned, we'll be shipping out the crew module, single digit number of days, and we'll go through a series of acoustic uh, Thermovac and then EMI, EMC testing. We'll complete that before we do the uncrewed flight test. Uh, and then on the bottom, a lot of successful uh, parachute tests. We've got two more balloon drop tests. Uh, next one will be in November out here at White Sands Missile Range um, to get through those two tests before we get into flight. But a lot of good progress to date. And in, in the mission operations. So the mission operations team uh, is really making great progress. Went through a successful flight operations review. Uh, the LCCs, the flight rules, are getting ready to come to board to be baseline. Tremendous amount of progress by the team running integrated simulations. Uh, we've done the emergency escape training, as you saw in the video out at the launch tower. Uh, and then we've gone out to the desert uh, with a full campaign to simulate the landing and recovery operations and, and make sure that team was, was ready to recover the crew. And then, you know, it was a great day when we had the crew announcement out in Houston. Um, really special for all of us. And, and, and really what we've done since then is fully embed them. They've been involved uh, with our teams, obviously, for some time. Uh, but now that the crew's been named, just fully integrating them into not only the training that they need, uh, but getting the familiarization, familiarization excuse me, uh, of all of our systems and our spacecraft. We've actually had them out there uh, in the factory when we've done powered on testing of the spacecraft just to drive in that familiarity training. And then looking forward, right? So obviously a um, few folks have talked about the need to get done and go fly. Uh, and so uh, we're getting much closer. So we'll get through the orbital flight test uh, early next year, go to the paddleboard test, right? So we need to do the paddleboard test before we do the crewed flight test uh, and then get to crewed flight test and, uh, and then look beyond, right? And get the cadence with NASA and then start broadening that, uh, that customer base. So a lot of progress and uh, really looking forward to getting to flight. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ben. Great, thanks, John. <clears throat> All right, wait for my charts to come up here. Um, also, again, thank you to Pat and Kathy. It's been a long time. We've also worked together in the cargo program, too, um, for a long time. And uh, it's great. It's an awesome partnership. Um, so we'll kind of talk a little bit about, um, again, what overall picture I always like to kind of take back and do the 10,000-foot the view. Um, you know, ultimately, our goal is to provide safe and reliable transportation services for both of our companies. Um, and, and safe is always number one, keeping the crew safe. Um, and um, as John and as others have mentioned today, you know, seeing what happened um, today um, with the Soyuz uh, is really important um, to drive that message home to all of us, how important it is that we always keep crew safety number one in our minds. Um, but reliability is also part of that. Reliability goes to the heart of safety. It also goes to the heart of, of running a program and managing a program, um, and in this case, keeping crew staffed and, um, and, and station running. Um, that's, that's really important, too. So you've got to be able to hit, not only have the opportunities to hit a cadence that we talked about in the last panel, but to actually hit that cadence. Um, and so that's why we're all working hard to get to flight, get to flight when we're ready, when we're safe to do it, but also work on how does that become a regular cadence that everybody can count on so we can keep those crew rotations going on time and keep station staff as planned. Um, you know, I, I think it's important, too, to understand, and, and, and we're all doing this, but we often look at the orbital vehicles um, when we talk about this process um, uh, of being in commercial crew, and it really is about the whole system. Um, there's an entire requirement set um, that, that goes for the whole system, what we often call the crew transportation system, or the CTS. Um, and it's important to understand that that's what we're really looking at. It's not just, in our case, Dragon, but it's also Falcon. It's the ground operations, the launch, um, the launch site, all the launch systems, um, recovery systems, and then all the actual operations themselves. But it even goes beyond that, of course. You're also certifying your manufacturing um, and your quality control processes and everything. This is a key component to the, what the commercial crew program has brought to us as a company, also to the industry, I think, is to say, okay, we're going we're gonna to rely on you to do all of this work um, to, to safely and reliably carry crew. We need to make sure that your whole process is certified. So that's a lot of what we, what we work on and we focus on every day. 
Um, and then um, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but ultimately um, what, we're getting, what we're driving towards is our demonstration one mission to ISS without crew. Then we'll do an in-flight abort test. We did our pad abort test a few years ago um, out of the Cape, um, out of our launch site down there, and that was very successful. Um, and then um, we'll, so after demo one, we'll do our in-flight abort tests. From there, we'll go into the demo two mission to ISS. Um, with uh, NASA astronauts on board, and then immediately move into operational missions to start doing that crew rotation services. There we go. Um, kind of the big picture view, too, of what the system looks like. I talked a little bit about the fact that we're certifying this whole system, so what is it? So, of course, number one and foremost for everything in the system are the crew. Um, we, uh, our Dragon is, um, for this program, is developed to carry four crew members, um, and, uh, and, and, and they're an integral part of that system and an important part that you have to understand all the time. I often think of them as, as not only, um, you know, the number one critical value of, 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 that we have to pay attention to and keep safe, but also um, um, they're their own, you know, cognizant engineer. They're their, own, um, they're their own piece of the system. And so we have to make sure that they're con constantly integrated with us and working with us as they have been for the last number of years. And since the crew announcement, they've been even more embedded in, in, in working on those systems together. Um, crew Dragon spacecraft, of course, it um, has the, uh, the capsule, um, is, is, is composed of the crew module and the service section. Um, our crew module um, is, the, uh, is basically the pressure section um, where the astronauts are um, and some of the cargo. Um, the service section is where we carry most of the um, propulsion system, the avionics and whatnot. That whole piece, that capsule itself, the, the crew module with the service section, is what goes up and, and is recovered and comes home. Um, and then there's the Dragon trunk. And uh, the trunk is fundamentally there as an interface to the Falcon 9. Um, it also serves um, for aerodynamic stability in the case of an abort, um, and um, also provides power on orbit, um, and also acts as a radiator. Um, and then a critical, and especially as we saw today, the, the criticality of this is an integrated launch abort system. Um, and that's um, through our Super Draco thrusters that are integrated into the capsule itself. Falcon 9, um, I think everybody's fairly familiar with Falcon 9, of course, Merlin engines, LOX RP-1, and landing legs. Um, we do um, always try to recover the vehicles and, and reuse them as we talked about in the last session wherever we can. Our ground systems for the crew program will be launching out of um, LC-39A um, at the Cape. Um, and then, of course, we have all of our ground software and comms and our launch control center. We have our primary um, Dragon, I'm sorry, primary Falcon control at the Cape with backup Dragon there, and then that's in reverse in Hawthorne. So we have dual redundancy on our control systems as well. Our control system, our control center is primary Dragon in, in, uh, in Hawthorne and backup at the Cape. Um, operations, I talked about that a little bit here just now, the mission control and crew ops, training and simulations. We're doing constant training and, and, uh, and lots and lots of joint simulations, um, both um, the, uh, the operators jointly with NASA, um, mission directors, launch directors, um, but also the crew um, starting into those simulations and working through all of that, and also at a management level, um, because there's, a whole, there's this whole other kind of, you know, other layer of operating mission when you're actually on mission that you have to work through. And so we're doing those, all those joint simulations together with NASA, and also working through our recovery efforts as well. Um, we talked about this already, so I'll kind of just skip through this, but we've had a great cargo program heritage. Um, the main point, though, is this ties to crew, is, um, is, is that heritage is exactly what we're building on um, as we move into, into crew. So the cargo heritage is what we continue to build on as we move into crew. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and every time we get to fly cargo, as we continue to do, it's just another opportunity to, to learn more and to build more confidence in the systems that we will be flying astronauts on. So some of our recent progress has been uh, exciting, and um, and I think uh, just to kind of continue the thought about every day is harder than the next. It's it's because as you get closer, there's just so much more that's coming together, and so much more that you're doing, and um, at the same time, that also makes every day more and more exciting um, as we move ahead. And uh, number one, the crews have been assigned, um, and as I mentioned, they are now working with us um, on an even higher uh, level and more you know, higher cadence than they were um, when they were um, the cadre. Um, we have uh, ongoing crew in the loop testing that we've been forming and training and joint simulations. Um, we've completed all of our flight operations reviews with NASA, um, and so all of those are done. We're ready to go. Um, as I mentioned, continuing the joint simulations and, um, and training as we go through. 
Dragon. We continued, um, we completed all of our uh, successful, successfully completed all of our stacked testing um, for the Demo 1 vehicle, and that's in final integration in Florida right now. Um, Demo 2 is an ongoing integration in Hawthorne. It's um, on track for shipment early next year um, uh, to go down to the Cape for its final integration run. Um, and our, uh, uh, we have uh, multiple integration reviews that have been completed both for Falcon and Demo 1. Uh, Falcon 9, uh, our Demo 1 first and second stages um, are in testing uh, at the McGregor facility. So that's great news. Both uh, vehicle stages shipped out of the Hawthorne facility. They're in final test um, at McGregor. Um, and then they'll be shipping down to the Cape to get ready for the Demo 1 launch. And the Demo 2 vehicles are um, in fabrication and test in Hawthorne uh, and on track for delivery for the Demo 2 dates. Ground systems, uh, the crew access arm is installed. You can see that actually on the bottom left picture. Um, and uh, excited about that and uh, basically ready it down at the launch site. And we completed our final operational readiness review for the launch site with NASA um, just recently. And that was great. Um, and then a um, uh, picture up in the upper right that you can see there is a cool picture too. That's um, our uh, thermal vac testing that's dragging, um, being taken out of the thermal vacuum chamber where we did the full up stack testing on thermal vac as well. Okay, I think we have a video. Yeah, this is our parachute, one of our, one of our many parachute tests that we've been doing. Um, we've done a number of different tests. This is one of the full-up tests with, uh, as you can see, this looks, um, this, is, this is a Dragon test vehicle. Um, it has the outer mold line of Dragon um, and uh, all the right mass and CG. Um, and this is uh, another one of our many successful tests that we've been completed, that, if, that we have completed and we'll be completing more as we move towards actually flying crew. Um, we're a big believer in testing and testing and taking that data and then taking the data um, from all of our, our actual flights and just constantly making sure that we're ready to fly. And uh, I love that part. <laughs> yeah, they do like that. <laughs> Everybody likes that. And a nice little landing. All right. And um, I think I might, yeah, there we go, perfect. What's coming up for the, uh, for the crew program? Um, so ongoing testing uh, and training. Um, so we've got crew in the loop testing um, that we do through the system end to end. We do training and the joint simulations that I talked about. That's really key, right? As we move towards uh, demo two, it's, it's critical, as I mentioned, the, you know, the first priority of the whole system is the crew. And we need to make sure that we're all working well together and that everybody understands exactly what they need to do as we move into those missions. Um, Dragon, the demo and spacecraft and trunk um, integration um, will be complete soon um, down at the Cape. And, um, and, those, and that vehicle will be ready to go. Um, and the Demo 2, as I mentioned, ongoing integration activities and shipping that out um, at the beginning of the year. Uh, our Falcon 9 Demo 1 uh, will be doing a static fire at our McGregor facility and then get shipped um, to, um, uh, to the Cape um, where we'll do a static fire with Dragon at the Cape. Um, and then our ground systems, um, we're um, finishing up uh, any of the upgrades and needs to be ready for, um, for launch out of those facilities down there. And um, uh, ultimately, we're driving really hard towards um, being ready for launch for Demo 1 by the end of this year, fully ready across all of the systems. And uh, that's it. Thank you. I figured we'd just let you come up, let you come up and start asking questions, because we were getting questions in the last session, so I figure you have a long list for I us I do on have this a session. long list for you. All right. You might be regretting this. <laughs> Benji's, Benji's already warmed up. He's ready. Okay. Okay. Um, <coughs> all right. So uh, to, to both of you, uh, to, to the gentleman on the, on the panel, what is your level of confidence regarding the revised test flight schedules announced last week, given the latest delays? We're very confident. <laughs> we were, don't worry, we're used to this question as well. I no, mean, I, mean, I mean, we are, right? I mean, you, you lay out a plan that, uh, that you believe you can achieve. Um, if, but if you look where we are, we're 85% through our entire test regime. So you've got 15% more discovery uh, or the potential for discovery, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the test is very important. We designed a robust test program 
uh, we'll go through it and, you know, if there's discovery that we have, we'll address it correctly and, and fly as soon as we're ready. Yeah, I mean, it, that's absolutely. You know, we, as John said, when you put together a plan, you expect to follow it and, um, and you do your best to get there. Um, but as well, you know, testing and integration as you continue to move through the process, you learn a lot. And um, so while we're all pushing hard to, to get flying and provide those services that again today we saw how critical it is that we need to provide it, you also want to provide it safely. So we, we keep saying it will always be true, we'll all fly when we're ready. Absolutely. Kathy, does your, does your team step up its engagement during these last critical testing phases? Uh, I think we've actually been working together really well for the whole period, mm -hmm. right? Because it's really the partnership and making sure that the, the right technical experts are working through all the way through that makes the last part go as quickly as possible, right? It should be at this stage, it, it should be we're, we're seeing the final pieces of data that confirm really the, the progress that people have been expecting along the way. So um, really our, our goal is to for both of us to get to the finish line at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so you have to do that as a team. Great. Along these lines of, of safety, um, obviously it's at the <coughs> front of everybody's minds today. Um, can you comment on the safety uh, requirements that have been levied on your, uh, on your two programs? What challenges they present and what impact they've had on your vehicle design from a technical, programmatic, et cetera standpoint? Sure. So I would say that um, the NASA requirements for safety on commercial crew far exceed any requirements um, that have ever been put on a, uh, on a human spacecraft, right? I mean, it is, it's, it's extreme, right? When you look at, but, but good extreme, not bad extreme. Um, <laughs> you know, when, you, when you look at the requirements, right? There's three requirements for loss crew, loss emission, mm -hmm. right? Um, when you look at um, the abort profile, you know, the requirements that NASA set out is, is you had to break out your entire SM profile into 10 second windows. And for every 10 second window, you had to prove um, that you could successfully abort within that 10 second window 90% of the time with a 95% confidence ratio, right? So that breaking it up into those bins drove, um, you know, significant analysis, significant test, uh, far exceeding what had been previously done on human mm -hmm. spacecraft. So good for them, right? Um, and, and so, you know, we, we ended up actually, as, as we got into it and matured and discovered, we ended up running three times the number of wind tunnel tests than we had originally planned, right? As, as, we, as we collected the information and learned, uh, we modified um, the GNNC response um, and, and the abort profiles uh, multiple times to make sure we got it right. So that drove um, a level of understanding and a level of robustness into the entire system that, uh, uh, that frank frankly, um, was, was very good and really ensures that, um, that the test vehicle, I mean, that the flight vehicles are going to be able to respond appropriately. So uh, you obviously have a lot of uh, experience from integrating the ISS. What would you say are some lessons learned that came from that process? But also, what are some things that your team had to unlearn from that as you were developing Starliner? Yeah, that's a good question. I think most, um, a lot of lessons learned in, in, um, in the design and how we fabricated that we learned you know, from shuttle. And then we also pulled in commercial airplane and, and fixed wing and rotorcraft, right? So we really tried to bring in lessons learned from shuttle, but then what is state of the art in manufacturing from, mm -hmm. from around the country? Um, you know, one of the things I mentioned at the beginning was, you know, we have for the crew module, we have an upper and a lower dome. Um, and one of the things that we do in the lower dome, it's got all the primary avionics, it's got all the life support system. But we leave those domes separated until near the very end of assembly so that we can get in and test them uh, before we actually mate the dome together. The reason is once you mate the domes, everything has to go in and out of the hatch, mm -hmm. right? So you get more people, more access, uh, more availability uh, before you do the final mate. So we learned that from shuttle um, and then updated manufacturing techniques. But you know, really, if you look at, at the at the systems engineering, the design process, um, 
you know, one of the things that we wanted to make sure of when we did crew was that we follow a proven recipe, right? So just because it's commercial, um, you know, we do commercial platforms all the time. And so we have a pretty rigorous and managed design process. So no corners cut, just trying to bring in newer techniques and lessons learned. Okay. Well, John, I'll follow up with another one uh, and kind of meld some of the questions that we've been talking about. So uh, do you have any update into the investigation around the, the Starliner uh, engine test problem this year? And perhaps if you can comment on how you've used uh, processes from other areas of the Boeing business. You mentioned uh, um, BCA. How, where are you and how did you get to uh, your current status and understanding of the test problem. Yeah, so during the, the first try at the uh, service module hot fire test, um, we discovered um, an inherent design uh, susceptibility in the, um, in the launch abort engine valves, right? So it caused them to malfunction during the launch abort test. Um, we didn't see them in the single engine test, which is, it, they only manifested themselves uh, during this, this integrated test. It, it really, um, a pretty subtle design change. We had some galling in the valve, a really subtle design change that the team's already driving in um, those redesigned fixes into the valve now. But you know, that's you know, one of the primary reasons why we, you know, when we drove out the integrated test portfolio that we have, was really to drive robustness uh, into that final design. And, and yeah, when, you know, the, the good thing, um, you know, about the Boeing company and, and the wide portfolio of programs that we have is, is we're able to immediately go pull experts in from across the country. So we had a number of folks come in uh, and help us drive through that as quickly as possible. Great. Um, switching gears again, um, you uh, debuted your, uh, your crew for your various programs not, uh, not so long ago. What's the age range, qualification, experience, et cetera, in your selection of commercial crew astronauts versus NASA selected astronauts? Well, for Boeing, you know, our criteria for the Boeing crew member was it had to be a previously flown crew member. And so that was pretty easy selection for us. You know, we, uh, we have one in the Boeing company. Um, <laughs> but he was targeted uh, from the very beginning. Uh, <laughs> And, and uh, it was important for us, right, to get somebody of, of his caliber and, and his experience um, because from the very beginning, you know, since 2011 when he joined our team, right, he really helped drive in the correct designs for anything crew interface, right? So he, was, he followed along and was integral into that entire design. The, the screens that we have, um, the instrumentation and control panels that we have are really his design, right? So he, he, it, it really helped us make sure that we had a sound, robust design from the very beginning. Sorry, I should have been a little bit more, uh, I should have been a bit more specific on this when we talk about commercial astronauts, not commercial crew astronauts. But commercial astronauts, uh, obviously SpaceX has announced uh, a, a commercial customer, obviously not for, uh, not for this mission necessarily, and uh, understanding that Boeing is also looking for, for other customers, uh, private customers come fly. How do you think of, of selecting these, uh, these customers from, a, again, from an age, qualification, experience, or lack thereof uh, background? I think it really depends on the model, and, and the customer really is going to drive the model, right? So if you look at, if you look at the, the NASA model, Right is is more of the rental car model, right? So we're we're responsible to train their crew, and then we'll turn it over to them, and that crew will operate it, right? A different a different commercial model might be that uh, they would expect to have a Boeing commander, and and their um, their company participants would be um, passengers, right? Mm -hmm. So it really depends on on what model is the right model for that customer. I, you know, at the end of the day, uh, our company was founded to create multiplanetary life. And so to do that, you've got to send a lot of people to space and a lot of people to other planets and, um, and to the moon and other places. And I, to do that, that means you have to not have too many restrictions. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we want to really open this opportunity up to everybody, anybody um, to fly. Great. Um, so, Kathy, I'll, I will uh, focus this question towards you. Uh, with 
with all of these, hopefully, all of these flights coming up um, in the next couple of years, what is NASA doing to uh, get ready for this sort of cadence? Organizationally, let's say in terms of numbers, in terms of uh, the type of qualifications of people that you're bringing in, what, what is NASA doing to, to stand up the organization for operations? So we've actually been in flow. Actually, our, our goal is to size down our organization from an operations standpoint. We've, we've been sized up to be able to handle two companies going through certification activities, and we're hoping that the program will be sizing down as we go into operations, understanding better the needs for the post-certification mission. So um, we, we've been working on, you know, what are the skills needed to be able to do that and from a long-term operations and, and starting, you know, looking at, at really what does it take to be able to do an operation. But this is going to be really important for us as we're working through these missions to understand what does it really take on both sides, mm -hmm. you know, for just as John and Benji will be figuring out what size teams they need, we'll be figuring out, okay, what size teams do we need to do the mission assurance function and and then obviously um, being ready and, and, and working with them on the mission. Could you give us an overview of what, once the, both of these organizations are up and flying, what roles NASA will continue to, uh, to play? Is it uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you just mentioned a couple of them. Will there be several people in the, uh, in the mission control, in, in launch control rooms? Yeah. Is it post data review? Where, where do you continue to play a role? So there's still, there'll still be a, a, a certain amount of compliance, how well you meet the requirements. Mm -hmm. You know, they're still part of our mission readiness reviews. We still have, we're part of the polls where, you know, obviously we want them to be responsible for, for performing the mission, but mm -hmm. we still gotta be saying, yes, we agree that the risk posture is okay for our crews to be able to fly on the missions. Um, obviously there'll still be a programmatic function along with, you know, getting the vehicles, as they're getting the vehicles ready, how are we buying down our requirement sets that we have to do, that we'll have to do from a human rating spaceflight perspective, along the way, along with working with them through the mission part, and then following along as we're working reentry, along with working with the space station program, right? Mm -hmm. Of course. Where our goal, too, is to figure out, are there other ways to be using these missions to further the space station and NASA's role as they're moving into the LEO commercialization? And are there other things that we could be doing potentially to be helping that function? So the same way Ben and you know, the companies all talked about ways that they were using and being able to leverage their capability, we're hoping that these companies also will be looking at different ways to help NASA as a whole in our goal for moving towards LEO commercialization activities. Wonderful, all right. One last question here. Um, so uh, we ended the last panel by saying, what is the one thing you're gonna talk about next year? Getting to human flight, of course, is really exciting. What would you say are the one or two specific, most complicated or difficult tests that you think remain between here and there? You know, it, it's, it's, it's demo one, right? It's flying the vehicle. That's super exciting. I mean, and, and it's, that's a big deal. We're going to fly this brand new Dragon um, for the first time, um, and uh, and and that's 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 what we're driving towards, and that's what we're going to be ready to do by the end of the year. Yeah, of course, uncrewed flight. Um, but as I mentioned, we're we're headed to the environmental testing, mm -hmm. and so we've got acoustics, thermal vac, EMI, EMC. Um, you know those. I don't think are the have the the risk of major discovery as, mm -hmm. as we've seen on some of the other programs or test programs that we started earlier. But you got to get through them successfully, as any any finding could cause delay. So we just got to drive through it. And Kathy it applies to you as well. Well, I, you know the, the the two tests I worry about because it's they're really new tests, at mm -hmm. least for us, is is the abort tests. You know. Um, these are very, you know, we talked about the challenging requirements of, of the abort requirements and, and having these vehicles being able to react very quickly, these vehicles that nominally, you know, operate in a certain mode and then 
you know, John having a pad abort test coming up, Benji having an employed abort test. These are tests that, that are extreme, that we're hoping never to be able to use the vehicles mm -hmm. in this way, but, but these are very extreme tests that um, will be tough tests. And so those, those tests, along with the demonstration missions, I think are, are gonna be um, you know, large, big events for us to get past. Quick follow on, will there be people in those abort tests or will they just no. be highly uh, instrumented? No, no, <laughs> we're, the, we're, we're highly instrumented, highly <laughs> instrumented. Uh, uh, test right. dummies, we'll have anthropomor <laughs> anthropomorphic <laughs> test dummies yeah. in there. All right, <laughs> good. Of, yeah. All right, well thank you, Benji, John, Kathy, for your time. Appreciate it for all the updates. Right.